This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Thanks. I'm curious to know before we start, how many of you are musicians of any kind? Wow. And how many of the people who are raising hands who are musicians are also in the medical community? Wow, that's very impressive. Awesome. Good. Wow. How many of you have ever, have never heard the St. Lawrence Quartet before? First, wow, amazing. First time. Fantastic. Now, how many of you have never heard Beethoven's A minor string quartet, Opus 132? <laughs> Don't be embarrassed, put your hand up. How many are really not sure because it's the kind of thing you don't know the name and you, they, I knew it, I knew it, it's fine, don't worry about it. Well, now, how many of you have no connection to the medicine, medical community at all? Oh, so it's a good bunch of you. All right, I don't have to feel so bad. Any wrong diagnoses and I won't get in trouble. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah, I want to come at this piece from a particular angle today. Though we tend to think of illness and disease first and foremost as a problem, as something to be cured. What I want to talk about today is the fact that illness can also be a source of creativity. And in the case of Beethoven, the actual passage from illness to health actually became the source of one of the most extraordinary compositions in the entire history of Western music, the third movement of the Opus 132 A minor string quartet, the so-called Heiliger Dankesang. Let me quickly give you just some context for this, biographically and since it is a medical program, some medical context as well. Beethoven died in uh, 1827 and his final works were the five late string quartets composed between 1824 and 1826. The piece we're going to talk about today, the Opus 132 Quartet A minor, was actually the second of the group and it was completed in July of 1825. While he was working on the piece, during during the winter of 1825, he became very seriously ill with liver disease, bowel inflammation, and other abdominal complications, or so we're told these days. And on April 18th, he wrote a letter to his doctor in the middle of all this, Dr. Anton Braunhofer, and he says, uh, quote, I hope that you will not refuse to come to my help, for I am in great... Turn off cell phones, pagers, and beepers. <laughs> I had a feeling it was Dr. Anton Braunhofer saying, wait a minute, it was April 19th. Okay. Um, so he writes to him, he says, I hope that you will not refuse to come to my help, for I am in great pain. Braunhofer was alarmed, and he, <laughs> and he gave him strict advice. Quote, no wine, no coffee, no spices of any kind. I'll wager that if you take a drink of spirits, you'll be lying weak and exhausted on your back in a few hours. He also recommended that he should recuperate in the country for, quote, fresh air and natural milk. The disease left Beethoven completely weak and exhausted, and he feared on the, ink, on the edge and the brink of death. At the time, he was planning to originally write this piece in a traditional four-movement format, but then on recovering from his illness, he decided to take the middle two sections and replace it with three movements with the central Heiliger Dankesang movement that we're going to talk about as the middle of this. Everything about this movement is one of a kind, unique, unprecedented, and it begins with the autographical, autobiographical title, which translates this way. This is at the top of the page. It says, Holy Song of Thanksgiving by a convalescent to the divinity in the Lydian mode. <laughs> More on that later. Though gratefulness for his recovery may have been the initial impulse to actually write this piece, uh, this, any, any seat except this one, uh, may have been the initial impulse in writing this piece. I believe that this piece was written from that kind of unique place that you can get to when you've just recovered from a serious, death-defying illness. That kind of place where suddenly, for the first time, the basic facts of existence seem almost miraculous. Breathing without pain, walking with ease, feeling well. But this piece is also written from a place where the memory of the illness is still there, and the contrast between that illness and the wellness that now is felt seems almost staggering. No one had ever written music like this before. And the contrast of this third movement with the music that comes before is unbelievable. Though we're not going to do anything of the second movement today, just to get into the world of this, I want you to hear the last ten measures of the second movement, which is this witty, elegant end to this almost surreal minuet, and then the first phrase of the Heiliger Dankesang, and then we'll get inside this piece. Movement two, 
elegant. Movement three. Isn't that an amazing beginning? Before we get into the truly mystical world of this piece, I need to give you some cold hard facts to really help you appreciate this movement's unique combination of utterly beautiful, otherworldly spiritual content, but also mathematical structural logic. The piece is actually an enormous 15-minute piece. You'll hear it at the end of today. And it's in five utterly clear large sections. There are three slow, what we'll call Heiliger Dankesang, or holy prayer sections. And there are two additional faster interludes marked feeling new strength. So the big picture form couldn't be clearer. Slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, although I really should say slower than you could ever believe, fast, unbelievably slow, etc. Also, so the sections are just holy prayer, new strength, holy prayer, new strength, holy prayer. Now, the shape of the opening section, though it can be really hard to discern because the tempo is so agonizingly slow, is as systematic as a mathematical grid. Follow this. It's almost unbelievable because you don't experience this when you actually hear it. There are five simple hymn phrases, and each hymn phrase is preceded by a simple prelude. Five hymn phrases, five preludes. Now, every single hymn phrase is exactly the same length. Sixteen beats, eight notes, two beats, every single one. Every prelude is exactly mathematically the same length, exactly half of the length of the hymn phrases. Eight beats, all in single notes. Five preludes, five hymn phrases, all exactly the same length. And it's all in the Lydian mode. Now, without going into an excruciating technical discussion of what the Lydian mode is, though if anyone here wants to have an excruciating technical discussion, I'd be happy to stay afterwards and do it. Um, all you need to know for today is that the Lydian mode for Beethoven meant that writing in it, which all of the three slow sections are, writing in the Lydian mode meant he could only use essentially the white keys on the piano. Not a single black key or accidental in any of the three sections of the Holy Prayer music. The whole thing in the Lydian mode. Now, this reduces tension in this piece to an unprecedented degree because you have only white key notes, you have only two rhythmic values, half notes and whole notes, that's it for the whole section, and everything is the identical structure, all the preludes and all of the hymns. Reduces contrast. Then, when you slow down the tempo to this glacially slow that you could just feel, that's almost impossible to play, you feel like you've entered some kind of directionless, suspended time that is some other world. That kind of time when you're in a hospital, when it seems like there will never be an end. It just goes on and on and on. Okay. Each of the five prelude phrases starts with one instrument playing a simple idea that then is imitated one by one by the other parts until all of them are in, and it takes exactly, as I said, eight beats. Now, if we speed this up and play only the four-note main idea, instrument by instrument, it's really easy to follow the idea. So we're going to speed up the tempo, play just the four-note main idea, instrument by instrument, and I promise everyone in this room will be able to hear it clearly, like this. down. And he only gets two. That's all he can do. Eight. Now, you can still, if we keep that tempo sort of fast, and we now overlap the four note ideas so that each one enters before the other one finishes, I think you'll still be able to hear the four note idea pass. But your ear might start to stray away from the end of each line because you're so excited and seduced by the new entry. But here are the same four note ideas, but now they overlap. See if you can hear it pass from instrument to instrument. Can you still hear it all? 
Yes, you'll learn if you come to enough of these things that yes is always the right answer. If you want, <laughs> if you want to get out by seven, yes is always the right answer. But now, when we add all the surrounding notes, somehow now magically, especially, and we bring it back to the slow tempo, now all that imitation gets submerged in the overall texture. Now you sort of hear the entry, then you hear the next entry, and you start to hear a melody and accompaniment like this. How many of you heard the four note idea passing around now and how many were seduced and listened to Scott's melody? <laughs> there are worse things to admit to in this life. It's perfectly fine. Okay, now, every note of that prelude lasts one slow beat. Every note of the hymn phrase that's about to follow is twice as long, but the tempo is so slow that you can almost barely notice that you've actually switched. Now, when you get to the hymn phrase, again, every note is two beats long, and the accompaniment moves basically note for note with that melody, and the effect is like a church choir singing a hymn that somehow has been transcribed for a string quartet. So I want you to listen. Here's the first hymn phrase. You'll notice, again, exactly eight beats, eight notes of two beats each. Here's the first hymn phrase. Listen closely. Now, I mentioned that slow tempo makes it hard to hear the connections. Is there anyone in this room who hasn't played this piece who could now sing me that melody? But is there anyone who could do it? Very hard to hear, right? It's so slow that it actually almost doesn't sound like a melody. It's timeless. Each note seems to exist only by itself. But now, if we play that fast and listen closely and prove me right and don't make me look like an idiot, we're going to play it fast and I bet all of you will be able to sing the melody on la. So let's play it faster and hopefully they'll get it right. Let's sing it. Ready, sing. Now, don't you feel like you're in church? That's exactly what you're supposed to feel, and it's much easier. But changing tempo affects absolutely everything. Okay, now, the sum, Reader's Digest version. There are five preludes, as I said. And in these five preludes, there are actually only two melodic ideas. The first one that you just heard leaps down at the beginning, so it leaps up at the beginning, so you can always recognize it by a leap up. The second prelude begins with the only other idea, leap down. But again, remember, you have only eight beats, and it's always passed from one instrument to all four within eight beats. So here's the second idea, leap down. One, two, leap down, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the second one. The third prelude also works with leap down, but it goes the opposite direction in the quartet, from the bottom to the top, starting with cello. But again, every single one, a mathematical grid, one instrument imitated by the others within eight beats. Here's the second version, third version. Leap down, leap down. The fourth prelude does the same leap down idea, but from top to bottom like this, with it coming in at different angles. Always eight beats. And the final prelude, the fifth one, returns to the opening leap up idea like this. Always eight beats. Mathematical. So, two melodic ideas for all five preludes, every one eight beats, always working with a single beat notes. You've now got all of the interludes by themselves, the five of them. Now let's do the hymn phrases and to give you an idea of really how it works. I'm going to put all the hymn phrases together at once. I'm going to get rid of the stuff in the middle and we're going to speed it up so it's like church. 
So these are the five hymn phrases all put together. And this is the hymn that's hovering behind the scenes that you never actually hear it. But this is the hymn that's hovering behind the scenes. Sped up all five without the interludes. Here are the five hymn phrases. Church. Bach. Phrase one. Phrase two. Though you never hear it, that's actually what's behind the whole piece. Now, this opening section, if you look at the printed page, actually only lasts 30 measures. But because the tempo is so agonizingly slow, and particularly agonizingly slow if you're in a room like this with no reverb, uh, it actually takes almost three and a half minutes to play just the first 30 measures of this piece, which is actually the length of many slow movements in other quartets. That's just the first section. Now, that slowness affects absolutely everything. You know that way when you're in a hospital, all of a sudden you have nothing but time, and suddenly when time slows down and you do things slowly, you notice things that you otherwise would not have noticed. So much of this piece is about slowing life and breathing down to a pace at which things that would never make an impact actually now make an impact. All of the melodies, as I say, they don't even sound like melodies. They become ethereal and otherworldly because you can hardly even hear the length of the thought. It's as if only God looking down could actually hear this whole thing as a melody. Then, not only that, you've got three and a half minutes in the Lydian mode. All white keys, so there's absolutely no dissonance. And you start to enter this unprecedented realm of a harmonic universe without any tension, without any direction. It starts to seem like any note could go to any other note, could go to any other note. And since we're all in the Lydian mode and nothing is dissonant, there's nowhere to go. We're simply at this moment, at this moment, mm. and this moment. Finally, in an amazing moment, after three and a half minutes of this in the Lydian mode, five phrases, five phrases, we have the first black key note. It is an enormous event. And that first black key note, and I will not tell you who is the good fortunate person here who has it, but there's a first black key note, and that moves us, that one accidental, into the second section, the feeling new strength section, which is so staggeringly different that never has there been more of a contrast than this. So here's the ending of the fifth hymn phrase, and then the movement into the second section, the faster section, the first feeling new strength section. You know, the word contrast comes from the Latin uh, stare and contra. Contra against stare to stand. To stand against, to stand next to. How can that music that they just played, the feeling new strength, even belong in the same world, the same piece, the same movement as that music from the Heiliger Zangazang? I mean, suddenly we have a key. Suddenly we have all the updates, the new versions of the classical period. There's trills, there's syncopations, there's harmony, there's tonal direction. And it feels like it's rediscovered as if for the first time, like rediscovering walking and breathing for the first time. An amazing section. Here's the second phrase, more of it. This is the new world feeling new strength. Second phrase. <coughs> trills everywhere, syncopations. You can hardly believe your freedom. Now we can even build a class direction, a long phrase, and a climax, and we start to repeat. Now, 
we're now going to skip ahead to the end of this section, the final phrase of this, and the return back into the world of the Heidegger Dantesang. Now, if this were Mozart, and you had to get out of this completely new world back into the other one, you know there would be this most elegant, finesseful moment where somehow this became this, and we don't even notice it was such a smooth scene. Not for Beethoven. Beethoven, the connection is utterly jarring. You know like those buildings in the 60s and 70s where you're supposed to see the plumbing? where you're supposed to see the structure, where nothing is hidden, it's right there on the surface. This is exactly what's happening here. He wants you to see the connection. Illness is here, health is here, they're completely different worlds, we go from one to the other, and you watch it happen in front of your very eyes. So much of Beethoven is about putting what was behind the scenes right on the surface for everyone to see, to connect. You'll hear at the end of this little section, the end of the Feeling New Strength, you'll hear three chords that end that, then you'll hear two connector chords, one chord repeated, two chords back into the world of the Heidegger Zangzang, and we're back. Three, two, one, everyone watches it, no pretense at a scene. Here's the end of this new strength section. <laughs> chords, two connectors, back to the Heiliger Dankazan, two chords. And here we are. Fundamentally, the second hymn section of the piece, the second Heiliger Dankazan section, is a simple variation on the first one. We once again have our five prelude phrases, our five hymn phrases. They're once again eight beats long and 16 beats long. The basic melody stays the same, though it's slightly decorated. The basic harmony stays the same. But we start to have a little bit of rhythmic activity. There starts to be some possibility of life as we return from the coma. A little bit of rhythmic activity in the uh, preludes. And we also start to have a little bit of rhythmic activity underneath in the accompaniment to the hymn phrases. I'll just give you one phrase to show you how it works. Here was the original first hymn phrase that you sang so beautifully just moments ago. A reminder. <laughs> Keep that melody in your ear. It's hard to hear at that tempo as a melody. The second time now, in the second section, it's the exact same melody, but it's up an octave in the first violin. The accompaniment has a little bit more rhythm, and that rhythm makes absolutely exquisite dissonances. And we want to actually exaggerate those dissonances so that you can't miss it. And the St. Lawrence Quartet is really good at exaggerating things like that. So we're going to exaggerate the dissonances, but it's the exact same melody, the same fundamental harmony, a little more rhythm with wonderful dissonances. Listen to these. Up an octave. Distance is spectacular. I mean, this is the world of the Heiliger Gonzaga. Gradually, color is being filled in. Okay, we eventually come to the fifth hymn phrase, and we actually move into the second feeling new strength section exactly the same way we did the first time. <laughs> Unbelievable. No change is the biggest surprise of all. We simply repeat the same fundamental shift. You'll once again hear the three chords, then the two connector chords, and the exactly the same connection. Here we go. One accidental coming up. Here's the last hymn phrase. Hard to even hear it as a melody. Last hymn phrase. Who gets the accidental this time? I might give you a little hint. Feeling new strength too!
The second new strength section is very much a simple variation of the first one. I promise you, you'll be able to follow all the slight variations. When we come to the end of the second feeling new strength section, and we actually return in the exact same way to the, for the third highly gradonkazong section, you're sitting there thinking, I get it. I understand this piece. I've got it. Slow, fast, slow. We're going to go fast and we're going to come back to that opening section and we'll do a little bit more variation, <laughs> a little bit more rhythm, and then the movement will end and we'll go on to the next movement. As is so often the case in Beethoven, you could not be more wrong. So <laughs> here it is and enjoy it while you can. Here's the return to the final Heiliger Dank song. End of new strength. The three chords, the two connectors, the two higher gradankas on. The third section starts. And now, the most amazing section in the piece, and one of the most amazing sections in Beethoven. As I said, at this point, everyone expects just yet another variation. But Beethoven does something completely different. What he starts to do is, rather than simply decorate or repeat what was fundamentally a static, almost inaudible hymn, he decides to investigate its essence, to look at it like a sonata theme and focus and say, what is it really all about? Now, to give you some idea of how this works, let me remind you one more time and be ready listening closely because you're going to have to sing it one more time. <coughs> We're going to play that famous first hymn phrase one more time because the whole rest of this piece is an investigation, a stunning investigation of what that first hymn phrase really means. We focus in like this, put it on the lab slide. Here it is once and then I want you to sing it afterwards. Here was the original first version. Let's sing it on La. Ready, sing. I love that congregation-y type feel. Okay. Now, Beethoven begins the final Heiliger Dankesang section by reducing it, by saying, that's too much. I want to just focus on less. Tell me how many, there were eight notes in the original. How many notes does he reduce it to? Five. Now I want you to hear that as part of it. In other words, it's dum dee da 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 Wait a minute, I'm just going to do bum ba dee da dee Now what can I do with that? Well what he does is he actually turns that into a subject of a fugue. Don't worry too much about what fugue is. But what it means is there's a subject and then there's always a version that's sort of transposed, which means keeping the same basic pitches but repeating them on a different level called the answer. And that becomes a subject of a fugue. So first get the concept. We've got this tune we've been hearing. Now we're going to look at what it's about. We'll reduce it to five notes and we'll make it a fugue subject. Now let me show you just that much so you can hear it. I'm going to build up the structure for you from the foundation up. Think of this as the foundation, the kind of eye beams of what's going on. You'll hear it pass from instrument to instrument. Just the five note version. You know where it comes from. You sang it. Here we go. Overlapped here, the answer. Back to the subject. The answer. Okay, and now the amazing moment. What he's going to do is he's going to merge two worlds that always were separate. In other words, the hymns and the prelude phrases were always separate. Now he's going to merge them and he's going to actually take the version of the prelude music that you've just heard, the decorated version, and that's going to become the accompaniment to that fugue subject passing around. Now, there's no reason you should know this, but does anyone know the term for what accompanies the subject in a fugue? There's no reason you should know this, but maybe someone will and will feel really smart to answer it. Uh, the term is called a counter subject. Whenever you've got a subject, which is the main idea in a fugue, the music that goes along with it, we call a counter subject. So what I want you to just get is the concept. Here was this hymn phrase. Here was this prelude. Now we're going to make a hymn phrase shortened into the subject of a fugue. You just hear that. Then we're going to put the cement in the middle. That's sort of like the eye beams and the foundation. And in between, we're going to stuff a version of the prelude. So here's the prelude music. And you're gonna, I'm going to play it separately so you can hear it. It's sort of like the sandwich cookie on the outside. And here's the filling on the inside. You'll hear it get passed from part to part. Keep this in your mind. The counter subject. Transposed here, the answer version. 
So this is going to go with the other stuff. It's in the middle. I want you to hear it separate. Then she gets it back to the original level. You're memorizing this, I hope. And he gets the other version. So now, if you have amazing memories, put the two examples you just heard back together again. There's the foundation and the I beams there. That's the foundation. In the middle is what you just heard. We're now going to put it all together and listen to this amazing comedy. But just get the concept. So we've taken a hymn phrase. We've taken a prelude. Shortened the hymn phrase to five notes, made it a fugue subject. Taken the prelude phrase, made it a counter subject, and made this whole new combination out of what seemed like separate worlds. Listen to this beautiful combination. Subject. Counter subject. He's doing the subject. She enters with the subject. He gets the counter subject. She's doing the subject. He gets the subject. She gets the counter subject. He gets the subject. He gets the counter subject. Isn't that exquisite? Amazing stuff. Okay, now. The final section of this movement is in three parts. You just heard the first part. Each part, each one of the three parts, investigates that first phrase of the hymn phrase in a different way. The one you just heard investigated it by reducing eight notes to five and turning it into a fugue subject with a counter subject. The next one goes back to all eight notes of the tune and puts it in different combinations. In other words, shifts the I beams around and they overlap in different ways. Before we look at the filler, let's see how those overlap. Here we go. Here's just the I beams of the second section. Back to all eight notes. Overlap at the end. Overlap in the middle. Now, once again, the prelude material is the sandwich filling, the mortar in between the eye beams but now it starts to get developed. And to make sure you really hear it, I'm going to show you how it gets developed. It starts with her playing it all by herself in the complete version that you've heard many, many times, like this. And listen closely to her ending. Listen to this. Now, this is Beethoven. He listens at just that. He says, wait a minute, what about... Focus. So much of this piece is about looking closer at the things that normally pass by in life, but you're just focusing, focusing. What can I make out of this? He says, what if I put that up in the second violin higher, like this? Just the ending. Do it again. Wait a minute. I could do it here in the viola. Wait, two people could do it. Wait. Now I could do higher. I could make it even higher. And repeat it. But all coming out of just focusing on this tiny ending. Now, when we put this together with the melody, with the soaring violin playing the subject, getting louder and louder, more and more accident, you have an astonishing, shattering climax. Nobody but Beethoven could have heard the possibility of this shattering climax hidden in that nearly inaudible static hymn that we began with what I'm sure to you now seems like several hours earlier. <laughs> so here's putting it all together, just so you know, back here, I mean, it's so hard to hear when you put it together. He's doing this, it's all being passed through the parts, they're doing everything I just described. Listen to this amazing combination, unbelievable climax. Counter subject. Amazing. 
And as amazing as that is, the final section of the piece is even more amazing than that. Okay, we've had our first hymn phrase. How many notes does the first hymn phrase originally have? Eight, eight notes originally. Follow closely. We reduced it to five notes for the first section here. Now he's going to reduce it even more. This is, Beethoven is about searching for the essence, trying to find the meaning of what's in front of you, pushing ever more close to some kind of molecular essence. So we've reduced from, then we reduce to, now the last section will reduce to three notes to just, that's it, that's it. We're down to the atomic level. <laughs> and it's going to pass between the violins, starting on different notes like this, just the first three notes of it. Putting that together, then back and forth with the other part, sounds like this. Just the first three notes of your hymn phrase. Overlap with his. Overlap with his. Overlap with his. The final step is one of the truly most amazing moments. I truly wish we had the whole piece here to do for you because what I'm about to show, I'm going to explain it even though you don't know the rest of the piece, but what happens here is one of the most astonishing moments in all Beethoven. The final step reduces this even further. Okay, we've done eight notes. We've reduced it to five. We just reduced it to three. Now he reduces it one step more to just two. <laughs> That's it. The whole piece has now become this. And it just so happens, though you don't know it, the piece minutes of more, a whole three movements earlier began with this. F, E. We have just reduced this entire movement to F-E, <coughs> passing between the parts, and all of a sudden, not only is the highly Gadakazan world connected to the feeling of strength world, it's connected to the opening movement, and suddenly, like that moment in the Marabar caves, everything in the world is connected. So, we've now reduced to, to, now we reduce it to just passing through the parts like this. That's it. That's the first two notes of the hymn. Can you recognize it? It's hard to do. Do it up here. And it gets higher and higher as it ascends to the heavens. It's going to dissolve up in the ether somewhere. But just F and E, he takes it up even further. Darash. The first four notes. He goes it back. Three. The first four notes of it. And then he says, wait a minute, just notes two, three, and four. And then reduce the whole piece to nothing but its first note. Just an F. Became, 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 now becomes. And everything is resolved. Putting this all together with our counter subject from the prelude, the one we've been hearing so much, we get this astonishingly beautiful ending all in the Lydian mode. Subject. F E goes to her. She rises up F E not to power. Counter subject. You take the F E higher. He takes it up higher. Just two, three, and four. Reduce to the first note, just F.
Just one quick thought before we hear this entire movement. I mentioned at the beginning of the program that the idea that though illness, of course, want, was something to be cured for Beethoven, illness could also be the source of creativity. But there's one other fascinating aspect that I discovered really just while preparing for this program that I truly didn't know at all. While Beethoven was sick, hadn't yet recovered, in May of 1825, he sent a letter of respect and gratitude to his doctor. And in the letter, he actually included a comic canon with the text, let me read it to you, doctor, close the door against death. Notes will help him who is in need. And the text of that canon, which Beethoven wrote himself, suggests that the urgent need to create, the desire to create, the need to finish this particular piece was, along with his doctor, keeping the door closed against death. So illness can not only be the source of creativity, but need, the need to create, the need to have a purpose, the need to finish this quartet can also be a source of healing. As Beethoven says, notes will help him who is in need. That's a message worth remembering. And now let's hear the entire movement.
The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.